All right, how's everybody doing? Hotel. Hey, this is Michael M. Hotel, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, and writer. Uh, it is Thursday, May 17th, 2018. Thursday, May 17th, 2018. Okay, and we are live. So uh, share this broadcast on your own Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in also. All right. So um, it's been some time since I've talked about this topic, but today is the and today, uh, May 17th, is the anniversary of the um, running of the first Kentucky Derby. And we're going to talk about um, how black jockeys dominated horse racing, including the Kentucky Derby then were pushed out of horse racing because of racism, okay? There's a whole history behind this. Most people don't, most African-Americans don't know this history, okay? So I uh, hope everybody's doing well and uh, share this broadcast on your own Facebook page, invite your friends to tune in also, okay? And uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started. I'm gonna post the information here on the thread of the broadcast uh, and pin it. All right. Okay, so uh, this morning on the Tom Jordan Morning Show, the little known black history fact, they talked about Oliver Lewis, okay? Oliver Lewis. And, you know, we posted articles in the past dealing with the, um, dealing with the uh, history of African-Americans in horse racing and dealing with the Kentucky Derby, things like this, right? And I know uh, the Kentucky Derby just ran a couple weekends ago. I saw African-Americans going to parties for the Kentucky Derby and, and women wearing these big hats and African-American women wearing these big hats, things like this. I, I, I would guarantee you most of those women probably don't know the history of African-American uh, jockeys and horse racing, however. OK. All right. So uh, this morning on the Tom Jordan Morning Show, the little known black history fact was about Oliver Lewis, Oliver Lewis. All right. And Oliver Lewis was an African-American man, and he was the uh, first winner of the Kentucky Derby, okay? So the uh, Kentucky Derby, uh, which is the first of the Triple Crown, which is the first race of the Triple Crown of thoroughbred horse racing, began on this day, May 17th, 1875. The odds were good that an African-American or black jockey would win the prestigious contest with Oliver Lewis becoming the first to do so. OK, so Oliver Lewis was only 19 years old. OK, when he won the first Kentucky Derby, he was a Kentucky native and the horse he ran on. The name of the horse was Aristides, Aristides. And uh, this was a horse trained by an African-American man who uh, by, by, a, by a black man and a former slave, African-American man and a former slave, okay? That, that, that was the trainer of the horse as well. Uh, his name was Ansel Williamson. Ansel Williamson was the African-American trainer of Aristides, the horse that, that won the first Kentucky Derby, and Ansel Williamson was a former slave. So 1875 is 10 years after the Civil War ends. So if you saw our broadcast yesterday, uh, we talked about, um, uh, I just, uh, we, uh, we saw our broadcast yesterday. We talked some about, uh, the history of the civil war. Uh, we talked about, um, uh, reconstruction, things like this, right? Check out our broadcast from, uh, I think it was what, May 16th, uh, our last broadcast. Okay. And, uh, I'll give you the title of it here. Slavery. Oh, well, I talked about the, the Koch brothers, uh, teaching white whitewashed history of slavery. Slavery taught by the Koch brothers teaches whitewashed history to children. Check that out here on Facebook, the African History Network on Facebook and our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P on uh, YouTube. Okay, so the Civil War ends in um, 1865, uh, officially ends June 2nd, 1865. The 13th Amendment is ratified December 6, 1865, adopted, adopted December 18, 1865. And we go into the period of reconstruction from 1865 to 1877, okay? So the first Kentucky Derby was ran 10 years after slavery ends, okay? 
So um, you have Oliver Lewis, 19 years old. I think Oliver Lewis was a former slave also. I think he was a former slave as well. Uh, but we know Ansel Williamson, who was the trainer of Aristides, was a former slave as well. Now, among the field of writers at the Louisville Jockey Club, okay, 13 of the 15 writers in the first Kentucky Derby were African American. 13 of the 15 writers, jockeys in the first Kentucky Derby were African American, okay? And this was not uncommon, okay, at the tail end of the 19th century, the tail end of the 1800s. Uh, and considering the sports popularity uh, uh, across the Deep South, okay? Because during slavery, African American jockeys dominated horse racing. And if you were a jockey, right? you were very valuable usually to your slave owner. Okay, so we're gonna get into some of this history. And then African-Americans are gonna be pushed out of horse racing. So then they go from being it, from, from it being common to being an African-American jockey, to it being, being an anomaly to being an African-American jockey. Now, another horse named Chesapeake, ridden by jockey William Henry, was the favorite horse to, to win. So Oliver Lewis was instructed to speed ahead of the pack and tire his horse Aristide out, then throw the race. However, the horse Chesapeake, ridden by jockey William Henry, tagged by the group and uh, 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 Chesapeake tagged, lagged by the group and Aristides finished um, 1.5, uh, finished the 1.5 mile race by two lengths. So Oliver Lewis, this 19 year old African-American man went on to take second place in the Belmont Stakes in New York that same season and won more races before walking away from the sport for good. Now by the 1920s, so we go from 1875, May 17th, 1875 this is the anniversary of the first Kentucky Derby being ran. We go from 1875 to the 1920s. By the 1920s, African-American jockeys had all but disappeared from the sport and were relegated to lesser jobs, such as cleaning stables and training horses, okay? One of the most famous African-American jockeys, his name was Jimmy Wink Winkfield. And we've posted articles here on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network about him as well, Jimmy Wink Winkfield who won the Kentucky Derby in 1901 and 1902, okay? And he was the, la he was the last African-American jockey. He was the last African-American jockey to win the Kentucky Derby. Now, in the year 2000, Marlon St. Julian, Marlon St. Julian became the first African-American jockey to ride in the Kentucky Derby in 79 years. The name, his horse is named uh, Kuru, uh, Kurul, C U R U L E, Kurul, uh, and he took seventh place. Okay, so check out this article from BlackAmericaWeb.com, the little known black history fact Oliver Lewis, written by D.L. Chandler. Oliver Lewis, written by D.L. Chandler from BlackAmericaWeb.com, the little known black history fact. And this was the uh, little, little known black history fact this morning. On the uh, on the Tom Jordan Morning Show, okay. All right. So if we look at some of this history here, right? So you may ask the question: Well, how did African American jockeys who were dominating horse racing? What happened? How did they get pushed out of horse racing? All right. So if we look at some of this history here, as I said, African American jockeys. So African American jockeys won fifteen of the first twenty eight of America's most important horse races at Churchill Downs. Churchill Downs is where the uh, Kentucky Derby is ran, okay? In fact, every rider on the track at the first Kentucky Derby was African-American except for two. So 13, some sources say 14 out of 15, but most say 13 out of 15, okay, were African-American. Um, there was a time when riding a racehorse was almost exclusively an African-American occupation. So it began with slave plantation owners, plantation owners using lightweight enslaved African boys to race their horses against rival owners. 
Okay, so they're taking slave boys, African American slave boys who are lightweight and using them as jockeys. Now, being a jockey back at that time was dangerous also. Okay, you can be killed in horse accidents. Um, some slaves were tied to their horses to keep them from falling off, resulting in injury and sometimes death. Now, horse racing was entertaining for white owners and slaves alike, enslaved Africans alike, and one of the, uh, and, and, and one of the few ways for uh, slaves to achieve status. So I talked about before how there are at least 262 skills, trades, and crafts that African people had in this country from 1865, from, from 1619 to 1865, okay? We talked about that before. And um, when you were, when you had sports prowess, you were, you could wrestle, you could be a boxer or a bare knuckle boxer or something like that. You could be a jockey, okay? If we, when you saw Roots, right? We saw Chicken George. Chicken George was good at cockfighting. This was a sport. So any any type of sport that white people could bet on, bet money on, okay? This, if you had an expertise at that, uh, this gave you more status. This gave you oftentimes more, a little more freedom, um, and then also you could earn money in in many instances, you could earn some money as well. So when we look at Chicken George in Roots, Chicken George bought his freedom, okay? The money he earned, Chicken George bought his freedom. All right, so um, let's continue here. How's everybody doing? Okay, so um, so the, there, there was a time when uh, riding a horse was almost exclusively an African-American occupation. If we look at uh, from the book, uh, the other slaves, the other slaves, mechanics, artisans, and car and and, and uh, craftsmen by James E. Newton and uh, Ronald Lewis from 1978. In this book, they list the 262 skills, trades, and crafts that African people had in this country from uh, 1619 to 1865. Okay, and uh, they're listed in alphabetical order. One of them is 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 uh, a a uh, a horse shoer horse shoers those that make the horseshoes for horses horse trainers okay horse trainers were important as well okay and then um they don't list uh jockeys here but it may be under something else i don't know but being a jockey uh or a horse racer was uh uh, one of the skills that we had also. All right. Okay. So uh, now after the civil war, which had devastated racing in the South, emancipated African-American jockeys followed the money to race tracks up North in New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, because the South is devastated by um, the civil war. You have bridges knocked out, plantations destroyed, roads knocked out, things like this. So they're not doing a lot of horse racing in the South after the Civil War. Now, these colorful characters included Kentucky uh, Derby winners like, Will like Willie Sims, uh, who's African-American, who introduced the short stirrup to the profession. Isaac Murphy, another African-American uh, winner of the Kentucky Derby. He was the first three-time winner of the Kentucky Derby. You have Jimmy Wink Winkfield, who finished all four Kentucky Derbies he rode in, uh, in the money. Uh, he won the Kentucky Derby twice. Uh, you have others like Babe Hurd, B-A-B-H-U-R-D, uh, Babe Herb, Hurd, Soup Perkins, Alonzo Lonnie Clayton, uh, Erskine Henderson, and Billy Walker. These were, these were also African, African-American winners of the Kentucky Derby. OK. And these men were young, uh, relatively young also. So when we look at Isaac Murphy, OK, Isaac Murphy um, won the Kentucky Derby three times. Uh, he turned pro at the age of 14 years old. This is an African-American man, Isaac Murphy. He turned pro at the age of 14 years old. Uh, Alonzo Lonnie Clayton won the Kentucky Derby when he was 15 years old. Jimmy Wink Winkfield won his first Kentucky Derby at the age of 19. 
And then two years later, William Walker, uh, who was 17 years old, won the Kentucky Derby as well. OK, we dominated horse racing. All right. Now, Isaac Murphy became the first jockey to win three Kentucky Derbies. He won in 1884, 1890 and 1891. He's African-American man, Isaac Murphy. And uh, he won an amazing 44 percent of all of the races he rode in uh, a record that is, that is still unmatched. When we look at Alonzo Lonnie Clayton, who um, who at 15 uh, was the youngest to win the Kentucky Derby, he won in 1892. Uh, James Soup Perkins, James Soup Perkins, who began racing, he began horse racing at the age of 11. He went to Kentucky Derby in 1895. Now, 1895 is the year before Plessy versus Ferguson, U.S. Supreme Court case. OK. That's amidst the Jim Crow laws, separate and unequal or separate and equal. OK. And that's going to be overturned in 1954 with the Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court case. OK. And it just so happens that um, today is also the anniversary of uh, Brown versus Board of Education as well. All right. So history.com, which is the official website of the History Channel, I, I get the uh, I get the emails each morning from uh, history.com dealing with this day in history. OK. And um, 1954, Brown versus Board of Education is decided in a major civil rights victory. The U.S. Supreme Court hands down a unanimous uh, uh, decision in Brown versus Board of Education Kansas, ruling that racial segregation in public educational facilities is unconstitutional. The historic decision, which brought an end and end to federal tolerance of racial segregation, specifically dealt with Linda Brown, and we know Linda Brown just recently died just a few months ago. Linda Brown, who was a young African American girl who had been denied admission to her local elementary school in Topeka, Kansas, because of the color of her skin. In 1896, the Supreme Court ruled in Plessy versus Ferguson that separate but equal accommodations in railroad cars conform to the 14th Amendment's guarantee of equal protection. So the 14th Amendment goes back to 1868. See, okay, hold on. Um, the audio is distorted here. Okay, so. If you're just tuning, if you're just joining us, uh, hey, I'm Michael M. Hotel, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, research, election writer. We're dealing with how black jockeys dominated horse racing, then were pushed out by racism. How black jockeys dominated horse racing, then were pushed out by racism. OK. And um, today is the uh, anniversary of the first Kentucky Derby being ran, which was ran. Um, May 17th, 1875. Okay. May 17th, 1875. Okay. So you all should be able to hear me. Okay. All right. And uh, if you like this type of information, be sure to register for the online course that I teach called Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach them in school. Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. Uh, we have a, a, a course bundle pack of our online courses. They're all on demand. There's six in the bundle. And um, it includes that course, which is a 14 hour, seven session uh, online course, all on demand. We deal with thousands of years of history. Also, Great African Women in History, the Mothers of Civilization. I did an online class dealing with the film Black Panther and uh and others so they're all in there we just posted the link here on the thread of the broadcast and also uh, it's at africanhistorynetwork.com africanhistorynetwork.com right on the home page of the website okay all right so this ties in when we deal with the history of african-american jockeys and how they got pushed out of horse racing this ties right into plessy versus ferguson supreme court case of 1896 and as i was saying Today, May 17th, also is the anniversary of the groundbreaking decision of Brown versus Board of Education, okay, uh, which ruled that separate uh, and uh, separate but uh, equal when it came to educational facilities was unconstitutional, which was which overturned Brown, which overturned Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896, okay. 
And in 1896, the Supreme Court ruled in Plessy versus Ferguson that separate but equal accommodations and railroad cars uh, conform to the 14th Amendment's guarantee of equal protection. The 14th Amendment was 1868. This is what gave African-Americans citizenship. Um, read, uh, go to LOC.gov, LOC.gov, which is the Library of Congress's website, LOC.gov, and you can read about um, uh, Brown, you can read about um, uh, the 14th Amendment, okay? You can, read, you can read the 14th Amendment there, okay? All right, and we're gonna post this uh, link here on the thread of the broadcast from history.com, which deals with um, Brown versus Board of Education, okay? So all this history is all, all to, to understand what's taking place today, to understand how things are today, you have to understand the, the history behind these events. You have to understand the history behind these laws, behind these policies, okay? And the people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past in the present and the future to meet the needs of the community, okay? A people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past in the present and the future to meet the needs of the community, all right? Dr. John Henry Clark taught us that all history is a current event. Everything that's ever happened continues to happen in some shape, form, or fashion. So that ruling of 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson, uh, was used to justify segregating all public facilities, including elementary schools. However, in the case of Linda Brown, the white school she attempted to attend was far superior to her African-American alternative, and it was miles closer to her home. The NAACP took up Linda Brown's cause and in 1954, Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka uh, reached the U.S. Supreme Court. African-American attorney and future Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall led, Brown, uh, led uh, Brown's legal team. And on May 17, 1954, the high court handed down his decision. And in, a, in an opinion written by Chief Justice Earl Warren, the nation's highest court ruled that not only was the separate but equal doctrine unconstitutional in Linda Brown's case. It was unconstitutional in all cases because educational seg uh, segregation stamped an inherent badge of inferiority on African-American students, okay? It was, it, it was unconstitutional in all cases because educational segregation stamped an inherent badge of inferiority on African-American students. A year later, after hearing arguments on the implementation of their ruling, the Supreme Court published guidelines requiring public school systems to integrate, quote unquote, with all deliberate speed. The Brown versus Board of Education decision served to greatly motivate the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s and ultimately led to the uh, abolishment of racial segregation in all public facilities and accommodations. So when people look at the, the beginning of the civil rights movement, some people started with the Montgomery bus boycott, which started the uh, Monday morning, December 5th, 1955, because Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on that Cleveland Avenue bus on December 1st, 1955. Some people look at it, some people start the modern day civil rights movement with the lynching of Emmett Till, August 28th, 1955, in Money, Mississippi, okay? And the and the trial that took place after that. Some people start, look at the modern day civil rights movement and started there. And then others started with Brown versus Board of Education desegregation case, which tested the constitutionality of Jim Crow. And if you understand the Montgomery bus boycott, and I've done presentations dealing with Dr. King, dealing with the Montgomery bus boycott, things like this, the uh, Montgomery Improvement Association, which was the organization formed to lead the Montgomery bus boycott. And Dr. King was elected president of the Montgomery Improvement Association in December, 1955. If you understand what actually ended segregation on the buses in Montgomery, Alabama, it was not the economic boycott, it was the lawsuit of Browder versus Gale filed February 1st, 1956, okay, by attorney Fred Gray. And this was two days after Dr. King's house was firebombed. And this case went all the, all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And it was a U.S. Supreme Court case, the U.S. Supreme Court case of Browder versus Gale, 
that determined that segregation on the buses in Montgomery, Alabama was unconstitutional. And this is what actually ended segregation on the buses and ended the Montgomery bus boycott, okay? It wasn't the boycott that ended the segregation. It was the lawsuit that they filed that goes all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court that ends segregation on the buses in Montgomery, Alabama, all right? So, uh, but the precedent to test the constitutionality of segregation on the buses in Montgomery, Alabama, that precedent was set by uh, Brown versus Board of Education 1954, okay, which challenged the constitutionality of segregation when it came to educational facilities and overturned Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896. Okay, so let's continue. How's everybody doing? Um, let's, let's get a couple of comments here. Patrick said, didn't the same South Carolina deem that there appeared to be two Americas, one white, the other black? Um, South Carolina, what, what are you referring to? Are you referring to the Kerner Commission of uh, 67? I mean, what, what are you referring to? Um, let's see. So we got Eric, we got Alfreda, uh, William, Frank, Sis Ray Lay, uh, okay, Eric. Okay, let's 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 keep going. Okay, so so when we go back and look at the the jockeys who dominated horse racing, African American jockeys who dominated horse racing, right? Uh, we have James Soup Perkins who began racing at the age of eleven and won the Kentucky Derby in eighteen ninety five. Willie Sims won the Kentucky Derby in eighteen ninety six and eighteen ninety eight. Jimmy Wink Winkfield won the Kentucky Derby in 1901 and 1902, and he would be the last African-American to win the world famous race to win the Kentucky Derby. Now, Isaac Murphy, um, uh, Sims and Jimmy Wink, w Willie Sims and Jimmy Wink Winkfield have been inducted into the National Museum of Racing and uh, Hall of Fame in Saratoga Springs, New York. OK, now. Uh, Money is what ultimately led to the demise of African-American jockeys, according to researcher Kenneth uh, Wisenton, W-H-I-S-E-N-T-O-N, who's a retired sociology and business librarian from the Martin Luther King Jr. Public Library Brary, and uh, Howard University's uh, Founders Library in Washington, D.C. He says, quote, black jockeys did not just vanish from horse racing. They were banished. They didn't just vanish from horse racing, V-A-N-I-S-H. They were banished from horse racing, B-A-N-I-S-H-E-D. As the thoroughbred horse racing industry grew in, in America, so did the size of the winning purses and the prosperity of black jockeys. Less talented and envious white riders conspired to get in on the take. Less talented and envious white riders conspired to get in on the take. So as the prize money increased for these African-American jockeys, resentment in white and white men rose, okay? And they conspired to push these African-American jockeys out of horse racing, all right? So um, there is an article from Smithsonian uh, smithsonianmag.com, which is the official website of the Smithsonian Institute, okay? And um, I'm gonna flip over here to show you some of these, um, show, show you some of these pictures here as well, right? Because this is something that we need to teach our children. A lot of our children don't know this history. A lot of African-American adults uh, don't know this history as well, okay? How we dominated horse racing, and then we were uh, we were pushed out of horse racing, okay? All right, so let's see here. Uh, okay, so here is Jimmy Wink Winkfield. And let me try to zoom in on this here. Uh, 
Okay, so here is, here's an article from SmithsonianMag.com. The Kentucky Derby's forgotten uh, jockeys. African-American jockeys once dominated the track, but by 1921, they had disappeared from the Kentucky Derby, okay? SmithsonianMag.com is official website of the Smithsonian Institute. This article is from April 23rd, 2009. I have all this stuff in my archives, okay? So I do like constant research, so all these articles in my archives. Okay, so this is Jimmy Wink Winkfield, okay? And he was a two-time uh, Kentucky Derby winner and raced across Europe after racism kept him from being the best athlete in America's most popular sport, okay? And um, he won in 1901 and 1902, okay? Uh, Jimmy Wink Wingfield. All right, here is um, this is um, uh, Jimmy Wink Wingfield again, okay? Another picture of him. Jockey. And he retired from horse racing in 1930 after a career, uh, after a career of 2,600 wins, 2,600 wins. OK. Here is, let's see, who is this? This is uh, W. Walker, another jockey. William Walker was already under contract at the age of 11 uh, to an owner named Wood Springfield. And at the age of 13, he claimed uh, stakes victory. OK, so here is uh, W. Walker. Uh, let's see who we have. Now, here's Oliver Lewis. So Oliver Lewis won the first Kentucky Derby. OK, he won on this date, May 17th, 1875. Uh, he rode Aristides to victory in the inaugural Kentucky Derby, May 17th, 1865. This is Oliver Lewis. Here's Alonzo Lonnie Clayton, okay? So in 1892, Alonzo Lonnie Clayton became the youngest jockey to win the Kentucky Derby at the age of 15 years old, all right? So this is all, this is all history that most, uh, most African-Americans don't know. Okay, here's James Perkins, okay? James Soup Perkins. S-O-U-P. So at the age of 14, James Soup Perkins won the, um, he won the Lat Laton Latonia Oaks. The Times called him uh, the best lightweight jockey of the West. Okay, this is James Soup Perkins. And James Soup Perkins won the Kentucky Derby in 1895. So here's Isaac Murphy. Now, Isaac Murphy was the first three-time winner of the Kentucky Derby, okay? Uh, he won in 1884, 1890, and 1891. He had a, um, a uh, record of winning 44% of the races that he uh, rode in, all right? And he won America's first sports, he was one of America's first sports stars. At the age of 14, he rode in his first race at Louisville in 1875, okay? Isaac Murphy. All right, so here you have uh, uh, Willie Sims. Willie Sims won the Kentucky Derby in 1896 and 1898, okay? And uh, Willie Sims also changed the sport of horse racing when he introduced the natural American riding style to England. He changed the sport of horse racing when he introduced the natural American riding style to England, all right? So this is Willie Sims. Okay, and this is uh, Jimmy Wink Winkfield again. Okay, so I just wanted to show you some of these pictures, right? These, these, these are, this is history. This is our history. Okay, and, and unfortunately, a lot of our people don't don't know this history. All right, these are all these all men were champions. They were legends in horse racing. They were legends in in uh, in their own times. Okay. All right, so let's continue here. All right, so how's everybody doing? So if you like this type of information, uh, this type of information we deal with at the African History Network, this and a whole lot more, we deal with history in different time periods. Those, this is your first time here. I'm Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, and writer. 
be sure to register for the online courses that I teach. They're all on demand. We have a bundle pack of 10 of them uh, on sale for $60, regularly $130. It includes ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Uh, that's a uh, 14 hour, seven session online course, all on demand. We deal with thousands of years of history there. You can also donate to the African History Network if you like. That helps support us, helps us keep doing the research, pay the bills, stay on the air. Go to, uh, we posted a link here, paypal.me, paypal.me, paypal.me uh, forward slash uh, the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. And then also you can just go to AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and um, you can um, click on the yellow donate button right on the homepage. That helps out a lot. All right. And also be sure to register for uh, 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 register for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828, to sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828, to sign up for our email newsletter as well. All right. Okay, so the question that you're probably asking is, well, how did African-American jockeys get pushed out of horse racing if they dominated so much, right? So there was a New York Times article from the year 1900. So we know the New York Times is over 100 years old, right? So uh, this article uh, was entitled Negro Jockeys Shut Out, Combination of White Riders to Bar Them from the Turf. Negro jockeys shut out combination of white riders to bar them from the turf. In the article, in, in, in the article, it began uh, and it said, the decline of the Negro jockey has been so apparent since the season of 1900 opened that even the casual race goer has had an opportunity to comment upon it. Quote, the public generally accepted the theory that the old time favorites of African blood had outgrown their skill and really were out of date because of their inability to ride up to their form of past years. But the article goes on to say, quote, racing men know better. Racing men know better. Okay. Can you all hear me okay? All right. Okay, testing. Okay, sounds like it cleared up. Okay, so, okay, so this, this is an article from the New York Times from the year 1900 called Negro Jockeys Shut Out, Combination of White Riders to Bar Them from the Turf, okay? And it says, uh, the article goes on to say, racing men know better. As a matter of fact, the Negro jockey is down and out, not because he could no longer ride, but because of a quietly formed combination to shut him out. Not because, as a matter of fact, the Negro jockey is down and out, not because he could no longer ride, but because of a quietly formed combination to shut him out. So you had racism and you had the unionization, the unionization of white writers, okay? Now, um, the, if we look at the article from smithsonianmag.com, uh, all right, smithsonianmag.com, uh, once again, if we go back to that article, the Kentucky Derby's Forgotten Jockeys, the Kentucky Derby's Forgotten Jockeys from April 23rd, 2009, right? Uh, in this article, it says uh, racism coupled with the economic recessions of the period shrunk the demand for black jockeys as racetracks closed and attendance failed. With intensified competition for mounts, violence on the tracks against black jockeys by white jockeys prevailed without recourse. Jimmy Wink Winkfield received death threats from the Ku Klux Klan. Anti-gambling groups campaigned against racing, causing more closures and the northern migration of African-Americans from southern farming communities 
further contributed to the decline of black jockeys. So we know basically the great migration is from 1915 to 1960. You have 5 million, some sources say 6 million African-Americans migrating from the farmlands, from sharecropping in the South up North and going out West. And they're running away also from racial terror. Okay, they're running away from racial terror. And this is something that Brian Stevenson of the Equal Justice Initiative talked about with the opening of the lynching memorial in the lynching museum in Montgomery, Alabama, which opened uh, Thursday, April 26, 2018. He talked about how African-Americans were fleeing out of the South because of racial terror, and they were fleeing up North, okay? Now, Jimmy Wink Winkfield uh, dealt another serious blow to his career by jumping a contract. With fewer and fewer amounts coming his way, he left the United States in 1904 for uh, uh, Tsarist Russia, C-Z-A-R-I-S-T, -C Tsarist Russia, where his writing skills earned him celebrity and fortune beyond his dreams. Fleeing the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, Jimmy Wink Winkfield then moved to France and raced for another decade and retired in 1930 after winning 2000, after 2,600 wins, a career of 2,600 wins. In 1940, Nazis seized, captured Jimmy Wink Winkfield's uh, stables, causing him to return to the United States where he signed on to work at, uh, he signed on to a Works Progress Administration road crew, Works Progress Administration road crew. Back in France, by 1953, he opened a training school for jockeys. In 1961, six, day, six decades after winning the first Kentucky Derby, Jimmy Wink Winkfield returned to, the, returned, to Kentucky, to, returned to Kentucky to attend a pre-Derby banquet. When he and his daughter, Lily Ann, arrived at Louisville's historic Brown Hotel, they were denied entry because of Jim Crow laws. When now, did now, now Jimmy Wink Winkfield, this, it, this guy is a, a former winner of the Kentucky Derby, okay? And he won the Kentucky Derby twice, 1901 and 1902. In 1961, six decades after winning his first Kentucky Derby in 1901, he goes back to Kentucky and he goes to the historic Brown Hotel in Louisville, Kentucky. And we know Muhammad Ali was out of Louisville, Kentucky. He talked about the racism in Louisville. They were denied entry to this hotel. So after a long wait and repeated explanations that they were guests of Sports Illustrated, they were finally admitted into the hotel. Jimmy Wink Winkfield died 13 years later in France. Okay. Now, um, Okay, so let's continue here. So the article from the New York Times entitled Negro Jockeys Shut Out Combination of White Riders to Bar Them from the Turf goes on to say, quote, the Negro riders got mounts at first, but then failed to win races. Somehow or other, they met with all sorts of accidents and interference in, the, in their races. So they were sabotaged. You have white men who colluded, who unionized and colluded against African-American jockeys to sabotage them, put death threats on them, okay? Uh, Jimmy Wink Winkfield was, uh, he was threatened by the Ku Klux Klan also, okay? And this is how they were pushed out of horse racing. So the article from the New York Times from, from the year 1900 goes on to say, the, mean, the means employed to shut out the black riders are said to be that whenever one of the proscribed jockeys participates in a race, there is concerted action by all the white boys to bring about the defeat of the horse ridden by the Negro, quote unquote. The singular ill look, the singular ill look of black riders serves to remind possible employers that owners who expect to win races would only put up white jockeys. 
Okay. So you have to finance the rider. Okay. You got to pay, for, you got to finance the horse. So you want a winner. So you keep having black jockeys losing, losing, losing. You're going to shy away from them and go to white jockeys. Alonzo Lonnie Clayton was arrested shortly before post time, post time at Aqueduct Racetrack and falsely accused of trying to fix a race. A near riot broke out as barred black jockeys fought with right fought with white jockeys in Chicago. The black jockeys who remained in racing were reduced to exercise riders, hot walkers and stable hands, raking horse manure from the barns. Now, these were some of the greatest jockeys to ever race. And they get relegated to raking horse manure and being stable hands. The once unsurpassable Alonzo Lonnie Clayton passed away at the young age of 41 years old. He was a bellboy at a Los Angeles hotel in 1917. Now, Alonzo Lonnie Clayton won the Kentucky Derby in 1892 at the age of 15. He dies at 41 years old as a bellboy because he gets pushed out of horse racing. So you have white jockeys who unionize, okay? So the white jockey union movement started in the north and worked its, and worked its way through the Midwest and then uh, the south. It starts in the north, works its way through the Midwest and then the south. For that reason, Jimmy Wink Winkfield was still able to ride and win the 1901 Kentucky Derby in Kentucky because that union movement is starting in the north. OK, in 1902, he became the last African-American jockey to win the Kentucky Derby. He ran his last derby in 1903, placing second before Churchill Downs also suc succumbed to the pressure of the union. Now. A few black jockeys left the states, left the United States for Europe, where they extended their careers. And Jimmy Wink Winkfield was the most successful one to do this, winning every major race on the continent of Europe, including Russia's Moscow Derby, France's uh, Prix uh, du President, uh, and Germany, and, and the, um, a, a big race in Germany also, Grosser Press von uh, Baden in, uh, in Germany. Now, Wingfield made and lost several fortunes also, okay? And in Russia, he lived in the Moscow National Hotel. He owned a skating rink and held 4% of Russian railroad stock. He developed a fondness for caviar at breakfast and chauffeur-driven Duesenberg cars. Legend had it, if you were an American tourist and bet on a race that he did not win, you uh, you simply brought your betting ticket stubs to the hotel dining room where he would buy them back. That's a legend. Now, because racing was tremendously popular in the South, it is not surprising that the first African-American jockeys were slaves. They cleaned the stables and handled the grooming and training of some of the country's most valuable horse flesh. From such responsibility, Enslaved Africans developed the abilities needed to calm, to calm down and connect with thoroughbreds, skills demanded of successful jockeys. OK, there's an article from uh, SmithsonianMag.com that talks about this. Now, despite Jimmy Wink Winkfield's more than 160 races in 1901, Goodwin's annual official guide to the turf omitted his name. The rising scourge of segregation began seeping into horse racing in the late 1890s. OK, the rising scourge of segregation began seeping into horse racing in the late 1890s and 1896 is Pleasy versus Ferguson, as we just talked about. So you got to understand how all this history relates and historical events don't happen in a vacuum. They are the culmination of a sequence of historical events that have a domino effect that lead up to uh, a larger event taking place. Okay, so uh, uh, 
The rising scourge of segregation began seeping into horse racing in the late 1890s. Fanned by the Supreme Court's 1896 Plessy versus Ferguson uh, Supreme Court ruling, as we just talked about, that upheld the separate but equal doctrine, Jim Crow injustice pervaded every social arena. Okay, Jim Crow, uh, Jim Crow injustice pervaded every social arena. Now, white genteel class remnants from the world did not want to share the bleachers with African American spectators, though African Americans continued to work as groomers and trainers. Okay. All right, now, let me, uh, let me flip over to this article here from, um, I'm gonna flip over to this article here from npr.org and the root.com also picked up uh, this article also, okay? And this deals with how the African-American jockeys were pushed out of horse racing. Okay, and uh, the article from, from SmithsonianMag.com once again is uh, the Kentucky Derby's Forgotten Jockeys, the Kentucky Derby's Forgotten Jockeys, okay? That's from SmithsonianMag.com uh, from April 23rd, 2009, written by, um, uh, who is this? Lisa Winkler, okay? We'll post it here on the thread of the broadcast. So. If your child has um, current events at school, all right, if they have, uh, you know, they bring in articles about current events, have them take in some of these articles here to talk about the Kentucky Derby and how African-Americans dominated the Kentucky Derby. That should be an interesting conversation. Okay, so NPR.org also has an article that was uh, also picked up by the root.com uh silks saddles and discrimination okay it was actually originally from the root.com and picked up by npr.org also national public radio written by richard t walk richard t Watkins. silks saddles and discrimination and this also deals with the history of how african-american jockeys were pushed out of uh horse racing and they talk about the union unionization okay um All right, so we see that uh, we're going to see uh, segregation, Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896, um, which cements the Jim Crow laws and separate and, and uh, equal, separate but equal. We see economic recessions of the period are going to shrink the demand for African-American jockeys as racetracks close and attendance fail. We see with intensified competition for mounts, with intensified competition for mounts, violence on the tracks, uh, against African-American jockeys by white jockeys is going to prevail without recourse. We see Jimmy Wink Wingfield receive death threats from the Ku Klux Klan. We see also that anti-gambling groups campaigned against horse racing. Anti-gambling groups are going to campaign against horse racing, causing more closures of the racetracks. Um, and then we also see northern migration of African-Americans from southern farming communities further contributed to the decline of African-American jockeys, okay? Uh, with the economic recession, we see that is in uh, about 1893, 1893. 1893, 1894, you have an economic, uh, uh, really, really economic collapse here in the U.S. And this is um, what's going to lead to the strike uh, of the uh, Pullman workers uh, that work for George George Pullman. So if you if you heard me talk about the Pullman porters, and I dealt with that strike that took place right around 1894, and uh, George Pullman founded the town of Pullman, Illinois. He owned an actual town. He founded the town of Pullman, Illinois. He owned the bank there. He owned a lot of the housing there, things like this. And his his workers lived, a lot of his workers lived in the town that he owned. And 
they rented the they rented their dwellings from him and he automatically took the uh, cost of the rent out of their paycheck. Well, when the economic crisis hits in 1893, uh, Pullman uh, reduces their wages by about 25 percent, but does not reduce their rent. He also reduced their union representation. So this leads to a huge um, uh, strike by the workers and those who did maintenance and repairs on the Pullman cars. And you have this huge like strike across the country. OK, and then you have other labor unions getting involved in this huge strike. OK, but this was this was precipitated by economic uh, economic recession. It takes place in about 1893 here in the U.S. So, so you have to understand like um, a, a sequence of historical events. Now, the African American Pullman porters that we hear so much about, they were not they were not allowed to join this white union, so they did not strike. They're gonna they're going to strike years later, and you know the um, organization, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, is going to be organized by A. Philip Randolph. They're going to strike years later, but they were not allowed to participate in this strike that takes place uh, 1893, 1894. Okay, so, um, and very quickly, and we'll go to some more of your comments here. Uh, when we look at the uh, article from uh, NPR.org from Richard T. Watkins, uh, Silks, Saddles, and Discrimination, the root.com uh, originally had this article also, okay? Um, okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, uh, this article is from uh, May 5th, 2011. And an excerpt of the article, it talks about unionized Jim Crow, unionized Jim Crow. Um, and it says, uh, now, if that isn't the very definition of institutional racism at its ugliest, I don't know what it is. Remember, this was a time when the Jim Crow era began to take hold. Uh, the New York Times article describes how white writers enforced their ban on African-American jockeys through sabotage and subterfuge. The Negro writers got mounts at first, but then failed to win races somehow or other. They met with all sorts of accidents and interference in their races. OK. All right. So check that. Check that article out as well. All right. Let's go to some of your comments. And then uh, I'm going to talk briefly about the online uh, uh, course that I teach. If you like this, how you all like this type of information? How's everybody doing? Share this broadcast on your own Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in also. OK. How you all like this type of information? Okay, Glenda said, um, let's see here. So Glenda said, uh, white people cheat, lie, and steal because it's an even playing field and they will lose in any situation. Yeah, many of them, that's true. Um, hello, uh, okay, Willie is listening, is watching from West Memphis, Arkansas. All right, Brittany, how you doing, Brittany? Um, Okay, said so Michael M. Hotel was one of the most thorough researchers of our time. <laughs> okay, all right, all right, all right. Thanks, Brittany. I wouldn't go that far, but okay, <laughs> I, do, I do a lot of research. Eric said eye opening stuff. Okay, Brittany said love this. All right, so if you like this type of information, also be sure to um, register for the online courses that I teach. They're all on demand. You can watch at your own pace. You can watch from around the world. Um, it, 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 this bundle pack includes ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach in the school. Kemet's one of the original names for Egypt, okay? And it's a 14-hour, seven-session online course. It's all on demand. Uh, we do a thousand years of history. We do a PowerPoint presentation. We have video clips, book references, et cetera. The bundle pack is going to sell right now $60, regularly $100. $30. It also includes great African women in history, the mothers of civilization. Okay, we've got Chester from New York City. Anthony said, what are we going to do to change this pattern? It's still happening. Well, your history and culture uh, gives you your VIPs, your values, your interests, and your principles. 
and influences your economic empowerment and your political empowerment, your history. So a people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past in the present and the future to meet the needs of the community. So we have to deal with, we have to understand how we fought against these things in the past. We had targeted sustained economic withdrawal strategies. We had mass protests. We had legal strategies. They all work together, okay? When you look at, say for instance, in 1957, the Tuskegee Alabama economic boycott of 1957, which lasted four times as long as the Montgomery bus boycott. In Tuskegee, that lasted four years. Montgomery bus boycott lasted 381 years. What precipitated the Tuskegee, the Tuskegee Alabama economic boycott that lasted from 1957 to 1961? The state legislature of Alabama uh, wanted to redraw district lines in Tuskegee to lock out most of the African-American voters and bring in about 400 white voters, okay? Now, this is at a time when the African-American literacy rate in Tuskegee, Alabama was much higher than the white when the, than the white literacy rate in Tuskegee because of Tuskegee Institute, Tuskegee University. OK, so when you research this, the Tuskegee, Alabama economic boycott of 1957, which most people know nothing about, the state legislature wanted to gerrymander the district and redraw the district. So it resembled a 28 sided seahorse a 28 sided seahorse okay when you research this because when i went and studied this man i was blown away okay but this is how treacherous this is how treacherous people were okay so um this boycott lasts four years and it leads to the u.s supreme court case of gomillion versus lightfoot and what and what these african americans did was now they were inspired by the montgomery bus boycott okay which lasted from december 5th 1955 to December 20, 1956. The Montgomery bus boycott, they were inspired by the Baton Rouge, Louisiana bus boycott of 1953 led by Reverend T.J. Jemison, which lasted eight days and cost the bus company $1,600 a month, um, $1,600 a day. Dr. Dr. King called Reverend T.J. Jemison to get advice on how to implement the Montgomery bus boycott. And, 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 that, and that bus boycott, uh, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, 1953, which most people never heard of. And there's a documentary about it. I, I went and I watched the documentary and researched this. That served as a template for the Montgomery bus boycott, but the Montgomery bus boycott served as a template also for the Tuskegee, Alabama economic boycott of 57 and 61. And what they did in Tuskegee, Alabama was uh, many of them made an 80 mile round trip to Montgomery, Alabama to buy their groceries and buy goods and things like this, because what they said was they said that we're not going to continue to support those who are doing harm to us. And they boycotted the white businesses in Tuskegee, Alabama, and put 100 business. They put 100 white owned businesses out of business. A people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past. In the present and the future to meet the needs of the community. So, so we have to understand our history and how we dealt with these problems, how we dealt with these issues. If you, if you study uh, the movie, The Birth of a Nation, which debuted February 8th, 1914, or February 8th, 1915, February 8th, 1915, the movie, The Birth of a Nation, right? That was precipitated by a play uh, that came out in 1906 called The Klansman. And when the play, The Klansman, uh, uh, played in Philadelphia, you had 3,000 African Americans who protested the play because we understood this was detrimental to us. We understood the dehumanizing depiction of African Americans and how it made the Ku Klux Klan the hero. Well, the Ku Klux Klan was founded December 24th, 1865 in Pulaski, Tennessee, okay, towards the end of the same month that the 13th Amendment is ratified, which freed the enslaved Africans. And when the and, and and the movie and 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 the and the uh the play the Klansman is based upon a novel called the Klansman by a man named Thomas Dixon. So that movie that that play is turned into a movie called The Birth of a Nation, which debuts February eighth, nineteen fifteen. And The Birth of a Nation calls race riots in the streets. But we protested against the movie because we knew it was detrimental to our existence because it negatively depicted African-Americans. It takes place during slavery, the Civil War and uh, Reconstruction. It showed the, the enslaved Africans as being happy slaves. All the negative stereotypes of African-Americans were shown in the movie. OK. And then the hero of the movie was the Ku Klux Klan. 
which uh, rose up to put down a rebellion by some former Union Negro soldiers. The Ku Klux Klan were the heroes of the movie. So this movie, this movie calls Race Rides in the Streets. You're dealing at a time when you have a, a huge increase in lynchings of African-Americans. And then you have this movie showing black men trying to rape white virgins. So not only did African-Americans protest against this movie, but the NAACP protested against this movie. You had William Monroe Trotter when the movie came to Boston who led protests against this movie because we understood we were under attack. Today, empire comes on every week and we don't protest that. Empire is the birth of a nation of its time. Empire is the minstrel show of its time. Because this negatively depicts African American shows us as dysfunctional and criminalistic. You see a, 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 a large amount of, of cursing and things like this. You see more vulgarity in the in the in the uh, show. So we today we don't understand when we're under attack because we're further away from understanding our history and culture. People's history and culture gives them their VIPs, their values, their interests, and their principles. It gives them a cultural paradigm that they see reality through. It influences their economic empowerment and how they use their economics, okay? And their political empowerment, how they use their economics to enforce their politics. This is why I talk about economic guerrilla warfare and political self-defense. Economic guerrilla warfare and political self-defense, okay? You gotta see some of the presentations. It's too much to go into right now. All right, uh, also if you, um, Visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, all my DVD lectures are there. I have about 80, I'm sorry, 80, I'm sorry, 40. I have about 40 DVD lectures there. I'm looking at eight because we have the um, eight DVD Black Panther bundle pack right now at, uh, at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And that includes two of my lectures dealing with the film Black Panther, which is a fantastic film. Very, very deep film on multiple levels. Uh, you get three documentaries, including Elementary Genocide Part Three and Black Friday Part Two, which I'm in, and some other presentations. That's on sale $80, regularly $130. Okay. The eight DVD Black Panther bundle pack. All right. Maxine said, I don't watch Empire. She said, You're right about the laws that benefit politicians and their cohorts. I just began understanding Anthony Weston. Eric said we must study our history thoroughly because it does give us the answer to solve our problems. Absolutely. We have a whole history of co-ops also. Read the book by Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhard called Collective Courage. Collective Courage which deals with a whole history of African-Americans involved in cooperative economics and the type of co-ops that we had. I interviewed her. That's how I know I, I interviewed her. Uh, that's archived. So we have about 800, over 800 uh, episodes. Uh, of our show archived at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. They're also on iTunes, they're on CastBox, they're on Stitcher, uh, different uh, places where you get your podcast. And if it's, some, if it's somewhere that you get your podcast that the African History Network show is not available, inbox me here at the African History Network and let me know or send me an email at info, I-N-F-O, at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com and let me know. Anthony said, Michael, our politicians have sold us out. The reason whites can still get away with most of the exclusiveness is because white supremacy is built into every law that's passed in this country. Well, most of us don't understand politics, one. Number two, we don't understand how to leverage our economics to push uh, our political issues and push our political agenda. OK, so politicians uh, do what we allow them to get away with. This is what we don't understand. Politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources. The legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and the writing of law, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. See, I'm on the board of Grits and Politics here in Detroit. Okay, and we and uh, we deal with political issues. We uh, bring uh, those running for political office in front of the in front of the people. Uh, when election time comes and we and we ask them questions, we grill them. We find out what's your agenda. How, how are you going to benefit African-Americans? How, you know, uh, a number of different things. So uh, we have to understand how to uh, leverage. Uh, number one, we have to understand the uh, political offices that people are running for. And we have to understand how politics impacts every aspect of our life. 
from the water you drink to the air you breathe to the food you eat. Politics impacts every aspect every aspect of your of your life. Okay. Right now we're broadcasting uh through the internet. Okay. Internet is regulated by the FCC and it is regulated by net neutrality. Okay. The Federal Communications Commission uh just ruled a few months ago to revoke uh President Obama's um uh, policy on net neutrality with, with net neutrality net neutrality, which will have a devastating impact for small African-American-owned businesses like ours. That's politics, okay? When you listen to radio, every radio station has an FCC license. That's politics. That's issued by the Federal Communications Commission. There are things that you can't say on the radio or you're going to be fined, okay? You have to buy an FCC license. There are guidelines that you have to follow, all right? When you watch television, they're, they're regulated by the FCC. OK, there's a there's a there's a license that they have to purchase. Well, so politics impacts every aspect of our lives. We don't most of us don't understand this. OK, we're impacted by politics, but we don't understand necessarily how it impacts us. And we don't understand how to impact and impact politics. This is why this is why voting is extremely important, because in, in cities where African-Americans dominate in their population, they should be running the city. All these. All these jackasses, you can vote them out of office. You have the votes to vote them out of office. You leverage your economics to enforce your vote. So you have targeted, sustained economic boycotts of the major sports teams in the city. You stop playing the state lottery, right? You uh, have targeted uh, economic boycotts of the downtown business district. You boycott those corporations in the downtown business district. You take your money out of the white banks and put your money in African-American-owned banks. You, you, you understand the concept of redistributing the pain through targeted, sustained economic withdrawal, and you use that to push your political agenda. Most of us don't understand that because we haven't studied the history. This is what Dr. King told us April 3rd, 1968, in his last speech, I've been to the mountaintop. Read, read my article uh, that I wrote because I write articles also. You can read all of my articles at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. I wrote an article uh, called, Why Did Dr. King Tell Us to Redistribute the Pain? understanding the power of economic withdrawal okay why did dr king tell us to redistribute the pain understanding the power of economic withdrawal okay and i and i and i uh, deal with this and deal with his last uh his last speech okay uh why did dr king tell us to redistribute the pain here's a video i did on this did i do this video yeah i guess i did do this video yeah okay yeah this is a video i did talking about it I guess I did this on the anniversary of his assassination. I guess I forgot I did that. That's so many videos. Okay. Yeah. That one right there. Why did Dr. King tell us to redistribute the pain? Okay. So uh, let me bring this up here. Uh, let me bring up this PowerPoint presentation here. All right, how's everybody doing? Okay. And if you look what's going on with Trump, I told people what was going to happen with Trump. People didn't want to listen. All you, all you had to do was go to his website and read his policies. You can see what you can see what was going to happen with Trump. And Trump has reversed over 100 policies that President Obama had in place, and many of those were very beneficial to African Americans. But since many of us don't read, we read the wrong things, we don't understand this. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Okay, just a second here. Let's go on. It should come up. Okay, so. Uh, here's some of the things we deal with in the uh, some of the, some of the things we deal with in the online uh, class. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Maafa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach in school, right? So we deal with thousands of years of history, and I deal with this chronologically. Okay, so you can deal with the transatlantic slave trade episodically as an episode in history, like it just fell out of the sky. Okay, and you can start in 1440 with the Portuguese. Or you can maybe go back to 1419 with Prince Henry, the navigator of Portugal, sending ships around the west coast of Africa. Okay. But the way 
I've been taught, and you, some of you all, a lot of you all saw the interview I just did with Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago when we dealt with Kanye West's comments about slavery. And slavery sounded like a choice, which it was not. That was something imposed upon African people. Um, we talk about teaching about the transatlantic slave trade chronologically. So you, you have to deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors to understand the transatlantic slave trade and, and what happened, the fights between Europeans and Africans in Europe, okay? So some of the things we deal with are uh, what was the transatlantic slave trade? What were some of the events that led up to the transatlantic slave trade starting? What role did Christopher Columbus play in the transatlantic slave trade? Uh, when did Africans first come to the U.S.? Because and again, see, Columbus is central. It is really important to understand the transatlantic slave trade. To understand uh, August third, fourteen ninety-two, you have to understand August uh, January second, fourteen ninety-two, when the Moors lose control of the last stronghold, Grenada, in Spain. Okay, you have to you have to understand that history. So you have to understand this chronologically. This is why this is extremely important. Okay, now. Um, uh, one of the reasons why this is so important is because the uh, the way that slavery is taught in our schools is is oftentimes mistaught. It's mistaught, is uh, uh, oftentimes sentimentalized, and um, um, is it, 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 the 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 chronology of how it's taught is wrong. Also, so this is an article from the Atlantic dot com. Uh, what kids are really learning about slavery? What kids are really learning about slavery? Okay. And um, it, it says a new report finds the topic is mistaught and often uh, sentimentalized and students are alarmingly misinformed. But what it talks about is how um, they surveyed 1,000 uh, high, American high school seniors and 1,700 uh, social studies teachers across the country, okay? And they found that of the 12th graders, right, among 12th graders, uh, only 8% of 12th graders could identify the uh, identify slavery as the cause of the Civil War. Only 8% of 12th graders could identify slavery as the cause of the Civil War. Slavery was the central cause of why the Civil War took place. OK, only 32% could correctly identify the 13th Amendment that we talked about as the formal end of, of U.S. slavery. OK. 35% thought it was the Emancipation Proclamation of January 1st, 1863, which did not free the slaves. It was the 13th Amendment. So if they don't understand how horrific slavery was and all levels of government were working against African-Americans and it took a constitutional amendment, a constitutional amendment means a change to the constitution. It took a constitutional amendment to end slavery. Then they don't understand a large scale and the ramifications of this. And we're still dealing with the, the issues that we deal with in this country today, dealing with racism, racism and white supremacy, debates over the Confederate monuments. All this is tied to the history of slavery, that 246 year period of time, okay? And a, and a total lack of understanding of this. So when you are trying to get your issues addressed, dealing with politics, you're trying to get your issues addressed, and you have people that don't even understand your history, this builds about an insensitivity to the issues of African-Americans. And then we, we, get, we get just blamed for all of our issues, which is largely not the case. Some things we have some control over, but a lot of this stuff is the, is the negative result of bad public policy, which comes from, uh, which is historical, okay? A lot, of the, a lot of the social ills that we're dealing with are the side effects of bad public policy, okay? All right, so check out this article, what kids are really learning about slavery from the Atlantic.com. And then it, it then it talked about how um, 46%, only 46% of high school seniors identified the Middle Passage or knew what the Middle Passage was, identified the Middle Passage as a transport of enslaved Africans across the Atlantic Ocean to North America, okay, or to the Americas, okay? All right, so, um, and then also check out this right here from, uh, the root.com new studies find that positive feelings about blackness improve academic performance for black girls. New studies find that positive feelings about blackness improve academic performance for black girls. So there's studies that show that um, teaching African-American history and African history to children 
improve their academic performance. It builds self-esteem, positive self-esteem. It boosts their academic performance uh, also, okay? And this deals with uh, uh, an article in the uh, Journal of Blacks in Higher Education. Uh, and it dealt with a study from Sharita Butler Barnes, a professor at Washington University in St. Louis, okay? New studies find that uh, positive feelings about blackness improve academic performance for, for black girls. All right, so check that out. Um, where are we going here? Yeah, Black Panther. So I've done uh, some presentations on Black Panther. So there's a there's a class I did dealing with the film Black Panther in the bundle pack. Okay. Um, so we have to understand, and I talked about this yesterday, right? We know that next year, six, uh, uh, 2019, it's the 400th year anniversary of those 20 some odd Africans coming to Jamestown, Virginia in uh, August 20th, 1619. But this was not the first Africans to come to this land. We, we've been here continuously for at least 51,700 years. This was our land stolen from us. This was, this was our land stolen from us. This is what we have to understand, okay? Um, Zoe said, well, brother, can you define the word, term African-American, where it comes from? Well, the term earliest recorded uses of the term African-American goes back to May 15, 1782 uh, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, in a, uh, 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 it was a, a book of, it was a book of sermons, a book of religious sermons, and it says by an African-American. This is the earliest recorded usage of the term African-American. It was not created by Reverend Jesse Jackson in the late 1980s. He reintroduced the term. The term African-American is a very old term. It's not a new term, it's an old term. The term Afro-American goes back to the 1830s. Mm -hmm. That's not, that, that, that term didn't start in the 1960s, Afro-American. Um, April 3rd, 1964, in the Ballad of the Bullet delivered by Malcolm X in Cleveland, Ohio. The next day he's in Detroit, April 4th, 1964, delivering the Ballad of the Bullet. But uh, in his speech in, in Cleveland, Ohio, April 3rd, 1964, he uses the term African-American and Afro-American as well, okay? And if you study during the period of slavery, you study free African-Americans, um, and even going into the late, 1800s, you're going to see we name our organizations after, uh, we name our organizations African or Afro, okay? So the Afro-American newspaper in Baltimore, which starts around 1882, it's called Afro-American. The National Afro-American League, which was the first civil rights organization around 1892, uh, it starts. And then um, 1898, you have the Afro-American Council. Uh, founded by Bishop Alexander Walters and T. Thomas Fortune. And we see you're going to have Dr. W.B. Du Bois that's going to be a member of that. I think Ida B. Well, Ida B. Wells as well, Afro-American Council. The Afro-American Council, because of a split in the Afro-American Council between a pro-Booker T. Washington faction and a faction that Dr. W.B. Du Bois was part of, which was basically against Booker T. Washington, you're going to have a split which leads to the Niagara Movement in 1905 being founded, okay? And the Niagara Movement was more progressive and they had an economic empowerment component for African-Americans. The Niagara Movement is gonna to lead to the NAACP being formed in 1909 because of the 1908 Springfield, Illinois race riot, okay? That takes place. And this is one of the first like Northern race riots in some time. OK, so because of that Springfield, Illinois race ride in 1908, you got about eight African-Americans killed. This is going to lead to the NAACP being formed because this is going to cause many African-American leaders to think that they're going to need a uh, interracial uh, coalition to bring about a solution to the race problem as opposed to just a uh, just an African-American organization like the Afro-American League and the National Afro-American uh, like the Afro-American Council and the Niagara Movement, okay? All right, so um, there are a couple of articles from the New York Times that deals with the origin of the term uh, African-American, but African people are the original people of this land. Um, 
the African people are original people of this land. Read the book, uh, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence uh, by Dr. David M. Hotel. okay? Uh, Eric Tuma said, I gotta get this book. And I've been telling folks that the natives weren't the first like the tallest. No, the um, African Americans were here before, African people were here before the people who we call Native Americans. African people are the original Americans. So if we look at um, page uh, 14 of his book, and he has a new one out right now, African American, uh, I, uh, I had to get in contact with him to get a copy of his new book. Uh, I need to interview him about his new book also. Uh, his, um, his new book is the, uh, the First Americans Were Africans uh, Revisited. So page 14 of his book deals with the uh, 13 different disciplines that document an African presence in this country going back at least 51,700 years, at least 51,700 years in uh, Allendale County, South Carolina by Dr. Albert Goodyear, okay? And um, uh, so they found uh, artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, footprints and lava, uh, genetic M174, D haploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics, uh, skull, skeleton, uh, linguistics paintings, skull, skeletons, uh, structures and tools, okay? Uh, 13 different disciplines uh, fairly documenting an African presence in this country going back at least 51,700 years ago, okay? This is before Native Americans come into existence. This is before Native Americans come into existence, okay? Um, so this is extremely important for people to understand. So when people talk about August 20th, 1619, yes, that did happen, but we were here for tens of thousands of years before that. One of the names of this land was called Turtle Island which is also a name that some Native Americans use for this land as well, okay? So when people say, oh, well, you know, they've been doing that to us since uh, they brought us to this land. You know, I don't say that. I say, no, they've been doing that to, to us since they got to this land, okay? Since they set foot on our land. This was our land stolen from us. Yes, we originally came from Africa, but we came much earlier than we have been told. So we claim Africa and we claim America. This is this is our land stolen from us, all right? And the Khoisan have the oldest DNA on the planet. So in the in the online course, I'll show you a video clip from Dr. David M. Hotel breaking some of this information down. But the Khoisan come from Southern Africa. They have the oldest DNA on the planet. They go all around the world. They're their ancestors to the Ainu and the Twa. And they were here. In Allendale County, South Carolina, they build the pyramid mounds. There's an a, a African presence from ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt here as well. OK, so the so the trick is to teach us we first came to this land, conquered and shackled in chains. OK, and, and the British brought us here. Right. So that that makes you think you're a guest in this land. No, this was our land stolen from us. Our nationality was stolen from us, our history, our culture, our land and the people who we call Native Americans are an offspring of an intermixing of the Africans who are already here, like the Khoisan, and then Asians who come here around 3000 BC, they're gonna intermix in their offspring or who we call Native Americans, okay? When we look at old photographs, of old black and white photographs of uh, Native Americans, we see that these are um, a dark skinned people. OK, these are usually dark skinned people. They're not like the uh, light skinned, almost white looking uh, Native Americans that you may see today. OK, we see that these are dark skinned people. So this is a book here. Chronology of Native Americans, Chronology of Native Americans, the ultimate guide to North America's indigenous people, the ultimate guide to North America's indigenous people. OK, and. Um, uh, what, what takes place is a lot of the um, African nations or African groups that were here, when Europeans get here, right, a lot of those get reclassified as Native Americans, but they're really Africans, okay? Um, you have the Algonquins or one, the Yamasee, I think as well, uh, but, um, but, this is, but this is what takes place, okay? And let me see, Yamasee, 
131, 132. Yeah. So a lot of these African nations, a lot of these African groups, African tribes, African nations get reclassified as Native Americans. Okay. And if you don't understand the history, you don't you don't understand what you're looking at. This is a way that this is a way to hide the history. Okay. It's just like when you watch the History Channel and they talk about the Moors. Okay. I was watching a documentary some years ago dealing with the Dark Ages, and they talk about the Moors going into the Iberian Peninsula in 711 AD. Okay, which in the Iberian Peninsula is today known as Spain and Portugal, where they show these Arab looking men on horseback going into Europe. Well, if you don't know uh, history, then you won't know that most of those Moors were Africans. They're, they're going in from Morocco and, and West Africa, not just Morocco. That's the initial, that's the initial ones, but these were African people. Okay. So the you know, Dr. Jose Pimenta Bay. Uh, so uh, a good book dealing with the Moors, Golden Age of the Moor, edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertima, Golden Age of the Moor, edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertima. Okay, but Dr. Jose Pimenta Bay, who's one of the baddest scholars on the history of the Moors, and he has an essay in this book, along with Renoku Rashidi. Dr. John G. Jackson, uh, Dr. Wayne Chandler, they all have essays in here dealing with the Moors. But uh, Dr. Jose Pimenta Bay talks about how if you if you do not understand the names that your people have had throughout history, you won't know how to find yourself in history. If you do not understand the names that your people have had throughout history, you won't know how to find yourself in history, okay? So when you read about Moors, you don't know they're talking about African people. You're looking for Negro, okay? You don't know the Moors were African people. When you hear about Phoenicians, when you hear about Carthaginians, when you hear about the Garamantes, okay? You don't know that they're talking about African people, all right? So this is a way to hide, to, to hide that history in plain sight, okay? Especially if you don't know who the Native Americans are. Okay, so this is an article here from New York Times. This is one of them. The term African American appears earlier than thought reporter's notebook. The term African American appears earlier than thought reporter's notebook. Okay, so check this out here. Uh, New York Times. I have other articles on that as well. You can research that. Okay. All right, let's go back to this. So, how you all like this type of information? How's everybody doing? Okay. Um, so, be sure to register for the online course that I teach. Uh, we have a bundle pack. It's 10 of them in the bundle pack. They're all on demand. Um, the most, uh, our flagship uh, course is called Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. So these, slide, these slides I'm showing you are straight from the class, okay? Uh, it's on sale $60, regularly $130. It's all on demand. You can watch it at your own pace, okay? So we have about 10 classes there. We also have Great African Women in History, the Mothers of Civilization in that bundle pack. Uh, we've got African-American resistance in the era of Donald Trump, voter suppression, reparations, and how elections have consequences. Uh, we had one class I did dealing with the film Black Panther. Uh, it's a number of them there, okay? So you can uh, register for that. You can watch it on your smartphone, tablet, computer, watch from around the world. Okay, so this is an article here from um, sciencedaily.com, sciencedaily.com, okay? And we deal with all this in the class and we try to deal with things chronologically. We deal with a lot of these archeological discoveries that have come out in recent years. So this deals with the discovery that Dr. Albert Goodyear made in 2004, okay? That Dr. David M. Hotel talks about on page 14 of his book. So the name of this article is New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. New evidence puts man in North America 50,000 years ago, okay? All right, and um, it says um, radiocarbon, this, here's a summary of the article. It says radiocarbon tests of carbonized plant remains uh, where artifacts were unearthed last May along the Savannah River in Allendale County, South Carolina by University of South Carolina uh, archaeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least 50,000 years old. 
meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age. OK, this is from November 18, 2004. You can read this yourself at ScienceDaily.com. All right. So not only were um, African people here tens of thousands of years before the transatlantic slave trade started. Now, I'm not saying the transatlantic slave trade did not start. I'm saying you got to understand the previous 50,000 years of history before it started. You have to understand the chronology of historical events. And the crucial period of time is that 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. And when they lose control of the last stronghold in, in Spain, January 2nd, 1492 in Grenada, you're going to have Moors who are conquered. You're going to have some who are enslaved and some are going to flee, but you have others who are going to be enslaved and taken into Spanish territories enslaved and taken into Spanish territories. Some of them are brought to this land. They're taken into Florida. That was Spanish territory. They're taken into South Carolina. That was Spanish territory. Now, if you go back to the 1520s, the Spanish were taking Africans and enslaving them into the territory we today call South Carolina in the 1520s. This is 100 years before Jamestown, Virginia. Now, Spain's going to outlaw slavery, right? And this is why... Um, we know that Florida was free territory. So uh, up until 1821, when it became U.S. territory. So um, the, some of the surround, some of the states that had slavery near Florida, some of those um, enslaved Africans who run away, they're going to run into Florida. OK, this is before the Underground Railroad begins. The Underground Railroad doesn't start to about 1831. OK, so you have a lot that run into Florida. All right. This is one of the reasons why the U.S. wanted Florida. OK, <laughs> because <laughs> because it was free territory under the, under the Spaniards. And yet a lot of African-Americans ran away. So that was the Underground Railroad before you had the Underground Railroad up north, which starts in about 1831. OK. So let's continue. We'll get out of here shortly. Um. OK, so, yeah, we deal with uh, some archaeological discoveries, some recent ones as well. And then um, we talk about uh, we, we try to deal with things chronologically as much as possible. We deal with um, the, the Moors and what the Moors take into Europe, because the Moors bring Europe out of the Dark Ages. They're going to save Europe when they go in. Nine, nine, about 90 to 95 percent of the Europeans are illiterate. You have kings and queens who are illiterate as well. They're going to take the teachings from ancient Kemet into Europe. Those teachings are going to uh, a watered down version of those teachings are going to come to the U.S. with the founding fathers, or as Dr. Francis Cress Wilson called them, the founding fathers. And if you that's just the three times. So when we see something like the Washington Monument, that is an African symbol called a Tekken, which comes out of ancient Kim and ancient Egypt, the story of Osar, Aset and Heru, Osiris, Isis and Horus is a symbol of resurrection. and you had Tekkenu for plural throughout ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. You had about 1,200 of them. Today, they're only 12. They've been taken. They've Some have been destroyed. Some have been taken because, uh, you know, you have culture thieves, right? So they've been taken to Istanbul, Istanbul, Turkey, and Paris, France, and Vatican City, things like this. But um, the teachings that the Moors taken in Europe are going to form the foundations of Freemasonry. OK, because they're going to they, they're going to Europe and their their goal is to teach and share this knowledge with Europeans, because their perspective is that everybody should learn. OK, and they're going to and you're going to have a group called the Poor Knights of Christ, uh, which are formed in 1118 A.D. during the Second Crusades. They're going to become known as the Knights Templar. They're going to get they're going to learn some of this information, become very powerful, very wealthy. And then they're going to be um, disbanded. You have a group that's attacked and disbanded, uh, rounded up in France in uh, about 1308, uh, October 13th or so, uh, 1308, 1309. And um, when they're so this is Friday the 13th. Right. This is this is said to be one of the reasons why this is said to be the day the novel stopped and one of the reasons why. People have a fear of Friday the 13th called Frigga Triska Decophobia. 
So these teachers are going to go underground and then resurface as the Scottish Rites of the Freemasons and the Rosicrucians, these other secret societies or societies with secrets. Okay. But the founding fathers are going to bring these teachings to the 13 colonies. Okay. So when we look at Freemasonry, the word Mason is derived from the Latin words mass and sun. Mason means child of light and expresses the desire to pursue light, which is a metaphor for the sun, which symbolizes knowledge. The term child of light or sons and daughters of light was first used to identify students who had completed 42 years of study in the temples of ancient Kemet or ancient Egypt. Many Masonic temples were modeled after the temples of ancient Kemet, places where light knowledge was imparted in a series of steps or degrees. So even today, when you when you watch a cartoon, even today when you watch a cartoon and you see a cartoon character that gets a bright idea, a light bulb goes off over their head because light has been associated with knowledge for thousands of years. OK, whether it's sunlight. Or what have you? Light has been associated with knowledge for thousands of years. So even today, you say I have a bright idea. You don't say I have a dim idea. You don't say I have a dark idea. You say I have a bright idea associated with light. Okay. And then when you read "Stolen Legacy" by George G. M. James, you understand the concept of the liberal arts coming from the ancient temples, where these teachings are going to be taught. Right. The concept of the liberal arts colleges. This comes. This is where this comes from. And then when you when you study the Moors, see the Moors are going to the the um, the first university in Spain, University of Salamanca, university first university in Europe, is the University of Salamanca in Spain, about twelve eighty five A D. That's built by the African Moors and some Arabs. Okay, and then the earliest um, colleges and universities in Spain. Cambridge, Oxford, University of Toledo, University of Bologna. They're going to be created to study the teachings that the Moors take into Europe. It's even written in some of their charters. Dr. Jose Pimenta Bay has done lectures dealing with this. Okay. He used to teach classes on the history of the Moors at Temple University. Last I saw, he's at Berea College in Kentucky. Okay. Berea College was founded in 1855. That's another story. I don't have time to get to that. Okay. All right. Read Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. Egypt on the Potomac. Because see, the layout of Washington, D.C. is based upon ancient African principles, which is one of the reasons why you got the, the Washington Monument there. That's an ancient African symbol. He says, this is one of the books we use in the class, right? So you don't have to buy any of these books. We use them for reference. Um, and then 50 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence were Freemasons as well. Okay? So this is all our history. Uh, so we have to become history detectives because symbols and Fragments of our history are all around us, but we don't understand this. Okay, a people's history and culture gives them their VIPs, their values, their interests, and their principles, and this influences their economic empowerment and their political empowerment. Okay, and what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. So here's a famous uh, bronze statue of Osar Aset in Hebrew. The Greeks called him uh, Osiris, eyes and a horse. Osar is in the middle. We see all set next to him with the horns and we see the son Heru with the falcon's head. OK, the Heru in his adult form with the falcon's head. All right. So some of the other things we deal with, um, we do it a lot. That's why it's 14 hours and there's some bonus content. Right. Um, so we talk about Let me go back to this here. Where is this? Um, OK, so we deal with the role Christopher Columbus played because Columbus, even though he never came to this land, we call it the United States of America. He's in the Caribbean and Central America and South America. Uh, he lays the foundation for slavery, racism, capitalism and exploitation of indigenous people. Uh, we do. When did Africans first come to the U.S. as slaves? Did Africans sell themselves into slavery? Were African people in America before the slave trade? Uh, we deal with the Moors in Europe. Uh, shocking archaeological discoveries that are causing experts to rethink everything. Insurance companies that took uh, our insurance policies on slave ships and enslaved Africans on plantations. See, this is extremely important because you had over 40 insurance companies just in the U.S. that sold 
policies on enslaved Africans on the plantations. So they weren't just taking out insurance policies on slave ships to insure them and insure the enslaved Africans on the ship. They were taking out insurance policies on Africans on the plantations many times, okay? Because some of us had very dangerous jobs. You were working in uh, uh, working in sawmills and uh, working on steamships, and coal mines, and all different types of things like this. Okay, so this is a, a part of the history that's not talked about a lot. Okay, how's everybody doing? So if you like this type of information, the, the, this we're talking right now. We're talking. We talked about the history of African Americans and horse racing how we used to dominate horse racing, how we got pushed out. Right now, we're talking about one of the online courses that I teach. And this is a preview of it. These are some slides from it. It's called Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach in school. And this is part of a bundle pack we have with 10 online courses that I teach. They're all on demand. This course here does with thousands of years of history. And we try to deal with it chronologically also. Okay. We deal with ancient Egypt. We deal with the Africans known as the Moors, and we deal with the transatlantic slave trade and how it happened. Uh, so we deal with Freemasonry, America, and the Founding Fathers, the origins of the term America and Africa. Because America, Africa was not named after Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus. I don't know where I don't know where that came from, but give it back. That America, Africa was not named after Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus, a Roman general. When you study his family, his family's last name was not Africanus; it was Scipio. Okay, we deal with the problem with slave movies while we're being bombarded with slave movies and slave themed TV shows. Because I talk about how this is this is large now, even though this is part of our history, the slave themed movies and 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 and, and uh, slave themed TV shows like uh, was it Underground? These are designed to keep us in a slave mentality, largely. See, this is one of the reasons why the film Black Panther was so popular. And I've done lectures dealing with the film Black Panther. I've read over hundred articles dealing with the film Black Panther. OK, I went and studied a lot of the past history of the comic book, the past 52 years of the history of the comic book. One of the reasons why the film was so popular is because it showed African people controlling the nation and it, it and it didn't show us as an, as slaves. This is one of the reasons why the film was so popular. And the other thing was it dealt with Afrofuturism and Afrofuturism deals with imagining a different uh, reality, imagining a different history. It, it, it involves Af the African diaspora and African culture and science fiction. And um, one of the things that the film showed us was what Africa could look like if our history had not been interrupted by slavery and colonialism. Because uh, Wakanda, which is a real word, by the way, Wakanda is not a made up word. OK, uh, and this is a, and in the um, I have separate DVD lectures on the film Black Panther, but I did an online class March 31st uh, dealing with the film Black Panther, which is in the bundle pack. Wakanda is a Native American term. It's in the Sioux Native American language and in the Omaha Ponca language. It means possessing secret powers, but it also refers to uh, God. It also refers to a deity. Wakanda is also in the Bant, one of, in one of the Bantu languages, and the Bantu is a group of languages, a group of African languages, especially spoken in Southern Africa. So the so the language that they're speaking in the film Black Panther, that T'Challa, the father, speaking to his son T'Chaka, is Isikosa. Isikosa is spoken in South Africa, and it's a Bantu language. And John Kanai, who played T'Challa, uh, who is T'Chaka's father? He's 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 uh, from South Africa. He speaks Isikosa. So when you when you understand that the first Native Americans were Africans, you understand the influence of African culture on Native American culture. Then it's it's not far fetched to understand that okay, Wakanda is also an African word. Wakanda is related to Rwanda, Buganda, Uganda. I'm not exactly sure of the exact definition, but um, that's not far fetched when you actually understand that history. So the film is extremely, extremely deep. Um, 
Ruth Carter, who's the costume designer, studied about 11 different African cultures. She infuses the African cultures into the costume designs. Okay, so um, in the in the eight DVD bundle pack, the uh, Black Panther bundle pack, which is why I go deep and deal with this type of deal with this type of information I do with the African cultural influences, things like that. You can order those DVDs separately, but they're at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, dealing with the film Black Panther, also. Okay, we'll put it there. And then we have it, uh, actually, the uh, three hour presentation I did, uh, that's on um, DVD download, also, it's on digital download as well. Okay, so these are some of the things we deal with uh, in the online class. It's a, it's a lot of information. To me, a long time to put all this stuff together. Um, we do it with Asar, Aset, and Heru with the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus, and the origins of the Immaculate Conception. Some of this information may be outside the circumference of your own awareness, and that's good, because the only way that you learn is when you step outside your comfort zone and learn things that you don't already know. That's the only time growth occurs. So if I only say things that you already know, you may say, oh, this is a waste of time. But the only time growth occurs is when you step outside your comfort zone and learn things that you are, don't learn things you don't already know. So some of this may be outside the circumference of your own awareness. Just because you never heard it before does not mean it's not true. It just means you have to go do some research to understand what I'm talking about. We deal with the links to ancient Egypt, ancient Kemet, and early Christianity, Freemasonry in America, and the fake Willie Lynch letter of 1712. Because just like the just like the um, uh, the quote attributed to Harriet Tubman, "I freed a thousand slaves, I freed a thousand more if I only known that they were slaves." I've used that in the past here and there, but that is a, is a false statement, okay? And I, I've dealt with, I just, I did, did a recent uh, broadcast where we talked about that. We talked about Kanye West and Kanye West using the, uh, a fake uh, a quote attributed to Harry Tubman and why is fake as well, okay? But the Willie Lynch letter 1712 was a fraud also, okay? Willie Lynch never historically existed, one, two, you got words in the Willie Lynch letter that didn't even, didn't even exist in the early 18th century, or the way they were used in the early 18th century is totally different than the way they use now, and the way they use now is how they were used in the Willie Lynch letter. That was written in 1970 by Dr. Parbina Ashanti, okay? So these are some of the things we deal with in the course and a lot more, and there are other courses in the bundle pack as well, okay? Um, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. Of course, we talk about the three great West African kingdoms of Ghana, Ghana, Mali, and Songhai. Okay, we talk about that. We talk about the attack on Ghana, also by the Moors, known as the Almoravids, who were some religious zealots. They um, uh, captured the city of Adelgas in 1054 AD. Uh, they attacked Kumbi in 1076 AD. This is going to lead to the fall of Ghana as well. Okay. Um, let's see here. And then um, we also talk about the origin of negative uh, stereotypes and images of African Americans also, and go back to 1820, 1829 with the creation of the Jim Crow character. Okay, that was uh, T. D. Rice right here. So a lot of people are comparing this to the pose that uh, uh, Childish Gambino or uh, Donald Glover did in his movie, uh, his uh, video, "This Is America." This is Thomas Dartmouth Rice, T. D. Rice. Okay, T. D. Rice, Thomas Dartmouth Rice creates the Jim Crow character. He, he's known as the father of minstrel shows. Okay. This is around 1828, 1829. Okay. So this is this is just some of the information we deal with in the online course. All right. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. And is uh we got a six DVD bundle, a six, I'm sorry, the 10 um online course bundle pack right now, also. Okay. And that's just one of them in the online course, all right? Let's go to some of your comments that we'll get out of here. Uh, let's post a link again here. This is available at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and also we have the link here, okay? And uh, when you order DVDs from us, when you donate to the African History Network, we register for our online courses, 
this helps to support the African History Network. This is a lot of research. Uh, it takes a lot to do all this. This helps us pay the bills, um, stay on the air, keep doing the research, etc. Okay, how you all like this type of information? The very few places you get this type of information. Be sure to follow our Facebook fan page, The African History Network. The African History Network. We do broadcasts throughout the week, and we're on Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. On 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation WFDF here in Detroit, and we broadcast on Facebook Live for the African History Network show. You'll see Dr. Boyce Watkins broadcast on our page. We share some other broadcasts also, like from uh, the Herb Alchemist. You'll see that as well, okay? Uh, let's go to some of your comments here. We got uh, Gordy. How are you doing? Trey said, I respect what you're doing. Keep doing what you're doing, brother. Help wake our people up. Uh, yep. You see, what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you have been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard and seen about yourself. OK, this is why this type of information is so important. All right. And I've been studying it for 26 years. OK. And um, I'm still I do research on a daily basis. Uh, Zoe said, but remember, brother, here in America, across the ghettos in these communities, don't know the tribes of the region of uh, the tribes or the regions of Africa they're from. This is true. This is why we need to be taught. This is why we need to deal with this type of history. OK, this is extremely important. This is why we have to get this type of information to our children. Uh, yeah, uh, you, some of you all saw the broadcast I just did dealing with the Koch brothers and how the Koch brothers through their Bill of Rights, through their Bill of Rights Institute, they're teaching a whitewashed history of slavery to our children across the country. They have miseducated five million children and 50,000 teachers. OK, uh, the real fight is among yourselves, father and son, Ham, Ham and Kush, Asia. OK, so when we deal with world history, we don't bring religious literature into world history. See, historians don't do that. So we don't talk about Ham and Cush and Ishmael and Japheth and all that. When we deal with world history, world history is in world history books. Religious literature is in religious literature books. World history is what happened. Religious literature is the result of what happened. To understand what's in the Helios Biblos, or what you call the Holy Bible, the sun book, Helios referring to sun, Biblos, coming from Bublos, which was the name of what was too deep to get to. Um, but Bublos was the name of the Phoenician capital where the early Christians go to to get the papyrus to, uh, which is a form of early form of paper, to write the story on, the, the stories on, to, to write what we call the Bible. But they're writing, these, they're writing these stories down that they see on the walls inside the temples of our men, of the Amen priest and priestesshood in ancient Kim and ancient Egypt. These, the, 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 the Helios Biblos, the Holy Bible, is, is a retelling of these ancient stories, okay? And uh, uh, bi um, Bible comes from Biblos, B-Y-B-L-O-S, B-Y-B-L-O-S, which comes from Bublos, B-U-B-L-O-S. So if you look up uh, Bublos, if you look up Bible in a dictionary, the etymology probably takes you to Bublos or Biblos. And it tells you that Bublos was an ancient Phoenician city that produced papyrus. OK, so they, they're going to name their they name the book after the city that they got the papyrus from. And then in honor of the Amen priest and priestesshood, they put Amen at the end of their prayers This is why you say Amen at the end of your prayers. And we've been told amen means it is so, but etymologically, no, amen refers to the hidden aspect of the creator as the sun is setting. The, it, amen or amun refers to the hidden aspect of the creator as the sun sets. All this goes back to African history and culture. So, but religious literature is the result of what happened. World history is what happened. And to understand this, you have to understand the ecumenical councils that take place from 325 AD to 1870, starting with the first council of Nicaea. Okay, we got to get out of here. Hey, remember at the African History Network, we focus on educating and empowering. 
and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Right now, let's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. Wakanda forever. Visit AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Peace.